some people just don't know how to take an opposing view and they really get into, and I know you've seen it too, oh, yeah, just yeah. Trying rhetoric to that's people. not healthy well, I mean, online you know, at all. Trying to reveal people's personal information, doxing, like yeah. doxing and harassment, targeted harassment. From It's just a really weird thing, man. Like I don't know where exactly this all kind of catalyzed from, but it's just over the last few years, you've got these very um, aggressive and targeted harassers on Twitter, and they've yeah. kind of formed into these little groups, and they you know, all talk amongst themselves about how important they are, and they're bringing down the anti-disclosure uh, enemies, and it's just like you go, you guys are batshit crazy. You know that, yeah. right? Like you're actually just a bunch of crazy people. So these bigger claims, yeah. I mean, I'm skeptical because we should be, we all should be, uh, and and we should be able to fire back com- comfortably on the claim. And uh, and if they're telling the truth, then it absolutely won't matter. But I, I hope when it comes to Congress, their next step is to go to the root of what David Grush was saying. Um, I have not seen any statements I've tried myself. He said that he was going to give some stuff even after the hearing of names of of where to go. Um, I haven't seen it. Correct me if you've seen it, but I hope that that happened. I hope that he turned around and said, you know, here you go. Me too. Here's me people too. to talk to. I'm glad David Grush was there. I, I think that, that that was needed. He needed to put his stuff under oath, and we need to to to, to at least pursue it. I have my skepticism. But taking that aside, I mean, this this has to be done. It's gotten enough attention. But the witnesses, David Fravor and, and uh, Ryan Graves, let me first say they nailed it. I mean, they're awesome. They, they were flawless in the testimony, convincing. All of that is great. But I think we need to move beyond that now, uh, because I think that, that that foundation that we've laid through testimony, uh, through witnesses that have come forward through the past five and a half years, that's solid, man. Nobody, it doesn't even, like skeptics can't even fire it. They'll try. But I mean, skeptics can't attack that because the foundation is there. John, are you controlled opposition that's being incentivized or in any way financed by the Department of Defense? Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Hoyas Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Coyus Institute. I'd love to get your overall assessment of the hearing. I think that's what everyone's talking about right now. So it'd be interesting to get your take on how you think it went, the kind of things that were discussed. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I think it's uh, it's a great development. I mean, of course, there's always something that you can say to want it different. It's never going to be perfect no matter what they did. Uh, but I, I think it was a great development. I think it was something that uh, needed to be done. I, I, I wish, though, I mean, this is this is kind of the the the, the pessimistic side of me mm-hmm. on on how it unfolded. I'm glad David Grush was there. I, I think that 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 was needed. He needed to put his stuff under oath, and we need to 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 at least pursue it. I have my skepticism, but taking that aside, I mean, this this has to be done. It's gotten enough attention. But the witnesses, David Fravor and, and uh, Ryan Graves, let me first say they nailed it. I mean, they're awesome. They, they were flawless in the testimony, convincing. All of that is great. But I think we need to move beyond that now, uh, because I think that, that that foundation that we've laid through testimony, uh, through witnesses that have come forward through the past five and a half years, that's solid, man. Nobody, it doesn't, even, like skeptics can't even fire at it. They'll try. But I mean, skeptics can't attack that because the foundation is there of testimony. So let's get beyond that. Let's let's figure out what agencies are covering this up. I've got my own list and get the agency heads in there. And I think that that a uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick has to sit side by side with David Grush. That yeah. has to happen. You know, like you said, like you said, David Grush was kind of that guy that was giving those types of pointers, or at least saying that in a closed session, he could give those very specific details about contractors and agencies. So I, I agree. I mean, I would, I would, I agree with you that 
having uh, Fravor and Graves kind of rehash these stories. Yes, a lot of people have heard them. I have to tell you, though, in the UK, I could stop most people in the streets. They've never heard of a Tic Tac or unless it's a breath mint. And uh, David Fravor or any of these guys. So it's good to reiterate. And I, I think it's good to get those those uh, statements on the record in, in testimonial form. But David Grush is the highlights of it. And he definitely is the one that's kind of going a little deeper into here. These are the contractors. These are the agencies. And I know we didn't get any of that on the record in testimony, but I kind of didn't really expect him to divulge very specific details that are still currently under some form of murky classification. Even if it's a very murky, like quasi-legal, quasi-illegal world, it's still just something that I think he can't just divulge in a in an open forum immediately. And a lot of the skeptics have been focusing on that, kind of saying, well, nothing was actually said, and this doesn't prove that he actually knows anything. And I was like, well, I, w I would say that the background of the ICIG confirming that he's got credible uh, information and the fact that he's actually willing to do this and put it into a testimonial form in, in Congress is certainly provocative evidence for him being in some way convinced of his own information. So, I mean, well, I, I know you said you feel like you've got some skepticism. So is that specifically in regards to David Grush himself or just the situation in general? Like, how, how are you feeling? Well yeah, and the claims, and let me first say, because because I think you really hit it there. The ICIG should be the one that's that's being grilled. And mm -hmm. the reason I say that is it's in the public realm that they found his claim credible. But none of us, me included, you, anybody, can say exactly why, right? right I mean, we right, right. that that's something I think we can all agree on. Why did they feel that way? Did they see something? Did they talk to a witness? Do they have evidence? Whatever that may be. That's why I think the ICIG should be one of uh, a group of people that should have been up there being grilled. Because again, all of that now is is in the public realm, something that's solidified. So let's find out why. And if they refute it, let's hear that too. But I, I mean, at this point, I think they would have if that was a lie. So, so again, Grush should be there. But I think again, this shouldn't have been a, a hearing that was an hour and a half or two hours, but rather a couple days. And I think that you really should see those those agency heads in there uh, that play a role in the obfuscation of all of this and have done so for decades. Now, to your question about my my skepticism, I mean, yeah, look, the bottom line is he's coming forward with claims that if you really dissect them are not really that drastically different than what we've heard before. You've got parallels between even the Wilson Davis notes, you know, just to bring that up. So there's parallels there between what he's claiming and stories like that. Now, true or not, there are parallels nonetheless. So my skepticism is, what can we do to bridge the gap between these types of stories and claims and solidifying it as fact? And I mean, truly solidifying it, that will turn the heads of not only people like me who kind of are, are the battle back and forth with what, what exactly are we dealing with, mm. but even the hardcore people that are like, no, there's no chance in hell there's anything extraterrestrial about this or or non-human or whatever, what will convince the masses? And that's what we have to try and get to. I'm not sure what the answer is other than the obvious, like bring forward the evidence, like a physical something from one of these crafts. But that's where I say turning up the heat is where we need to go. And although, again, I want to I want to continue to punch the point, I've got nothing against Graves' testimony or Fravor. They nailed it. But we've solidified that now. We've got congressional funding for this reason because that foundation is solid. So now get the agency heads in there and not a um, what I would call a softball hearing like Dr. Kirkpatrick and right, right, right. It, it, not like that. I mean, we need to truly push for answers and, and get a secretary of defense level someone in there, if not the secretary of defense, the DOD's inspector general. So we talked about the ICIG the inspector general for the intelligence community, but the DOD inspector general has run an evaluation on UAP now for years. That was announced in 2021. Mm -hmm. So what is it that they're doing? And we have had zero update. So if there's something criminal, I get it. Maybe they can't go there in an open setting. They can go to certain places though, and let us know what have they done since 2021. So that's the heat. That's what I want to see. And you see it to close the thought you see it outside of the UFO arena. I mean, I'm not looking for a, a WWE uh, a matchup here. Uh, I want to see what what we see in other hearings outside of the 
the UAP arena, because I'm one of those geeks that watches those things. That's what I want. That's what we have to have in, in the yeah. UFO side of all this. But we don't. And I don't know why. I really don't. Well, well, uh, I mean, OK, so I agree to an extent, but I was, I'd also say when it's funny, it's interesting, an interesting difference between between us. And I guess this kind of does draw correlations to the Wilson documents is that your element that draws skepticism is that this isn't something new that we've heard these stories before. And for me, my element of optimism is like, well, it's kind of reiterating stories we've heard before. It's confirming, it's, it's adding another layer of legitimacy because it's now under oath in a, in a congressional setting. So I actually spoke about that in the video I did recently where I was talking about the hearing and I was just saying that you know, the fact that this is now being put into sworn testimony, that there are these programs that are dealing with non-human vehicles, they're reverse engineering them. I mean, I would say that adds another level of potential credence to these previous claims from Admiral Bobby Ray Inman and, and Bob Exler and then, uh, you know, the Admiral Wilson documents. And so I understand what you're saying about the heat being turned up, but I would also say that this is an element of the heat being turned up. It's not necessarily the the largest temperature difference, but the fact that we've now got this GS-15 or former GS-15 intelligence officer under oath coming in with stuff we've never heard before. In terms of the public discussion in, in government and Congress, we have not heard that type of language being used about non-human retrieval and re-engineering programs. And so that's certainly a few degrees up from where we were maybe even a few months ago. So the process I'm talking about under oath or just in general? Well, just in general, but I would also say that having this guy under oath in, in a congressional setting, giving sworn testimony about these kind of things does in some way, at least to me, it, to an extent, validate or further validate the potential that these other stories that we've heard over the many years may be close to the truth about the existence of these programs. And the fact that he's actually in this setting, giving this testimony next to Graves, next to Fravor, is a signifier is a signifier of the temperature going up a little bit, um, and maybe this is the precursor towards those types of more revealing uh, hearings where real evidence is discovered. I, I mean, the amount of times he was referencing, and if this is you know sincere and he's got real information to share, the amount of times he was referencing, look, we can talk about that in a closed session. We can talk about mm -hmm. that in a skiff. I've got very specific details I can give you in a skiff. You know, these people have to give it to them. Some of these congressmen, they were asking some good questions, kind of questions you'd mm -hmm. expect people from this community to ask who've got background knowledge and want to ask very specific details. So it just makes me think, right, well, if everything goes the way that we would love it to go, he's now arming these people with the kind of information and knowledge they need to press further investigations into these agencies, into these contractors. Whether it will bear any fruit, I don't know, man, but it just feels like this is certainly at least a step. It's a step. Whether or not yeah. other things at play, it does feel like a significant step. It, it And there's no argument from me on that. In fact, minutes after the debate, I had tweeted that out and, and uh, X'd it out. How do you say that now? I don't even know. Uh, Regardless, yeah. oh, God, posted yeah. it. It took, posted. Me, it took me about 10 minutes this morning to find my Twitter app because it suddenly became an X. So I was became like, X. Oh, yeah, exactly. But yeah, uh, and that's why I wanted it, you know, known right away. I mean, that the hearing was better than I thought, so it was it was a step. I mean, my my, um, I don't even want to call it pessimism. Just kind of like the only thing that I would say uh, that that's not like, hey, this was a great step. Was I wish we could have had David Grush's sources there, and to go just to clarify one thing, I'm not skeptical of Grush's claims because we've heard them before. Um, that's not really why I'm skeptical. I want to know what the root of this all is, because we're always kind of like one way, you know, away from that information. So it could all just be the same people. And and I think that that's where we need to go. Now, I understand like the the the, the pushback on that ideology and mindset is the fact that they need to stay anonymous because they've got current working jobs. And, and I and I understand that. But that's what I hope Congress understands also is let's figure out what the root of these claims are. And I'm super intrigued by these. Th I think it's three. At least that's the rumor that they wanted that there were pushback. So they backed out. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of controversy that's going on behind the scenes. I want to know why, you know, I mean, because the whistleblower protection to to some point is there. So what what were they afraid of? Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, is if they're backing up Grush. According to the story, and this is a whole red flag for me, I'm not sure if you want to chat about it, but the whole fact that the DOD through Dopser reviewed what Grush was going to claim in the News Nation interview, 
why can't we have people that that at least support the exact same thing? Because it's clear the DOD cleared it, right? I mean, we can all agree on that too. That's how the story I mean, goes. His, but his his justification or his his reasoning behind that was that they're just reviewing. Because I thought the same thing of like, well, they've cleared him, they've given him a green light for this. But at least his explanation is they're just looking for kind of like security issues and national security. Correct. And so if it's even if it's like very provocative language, if it's not specifically revealing a problem, they kind of give it the green star. I mean, for example, um, uh, John Ramirez, he put out this pretty lengthy presentation on my channel that he had to get cleared through the CIA, through the agency. And they, they cleared that, but they didn't necessarily right. endorse uh, all of the you know opinions and topics that he was discussing in that presentation. So, yeah, I... I mean, do you think he's a legitimate whistleblower? Like, do you think that he's a plant, someone who's kind of been put into this to, and he's, you know, he's he's an asset being utilized, or is he a free thinking individual who's, you know, kind of woken up and gone, you know what, I need to talk to the ICIG? Like, do you think he's a hundred percent? How do you feel about well, Rush? Yeah, I, and this is the thing. Like, you, it's so hard to to comment on that without it seeming to be personal. But uh, to be honest with you, I truly believe that he believes what he's saying. So. The people that he talked to, whomever that may be, I do believe that that he likely believes it. I, I don't get the whole he's making it all up vibe. You know, I mean, there are certain people out there uh, away from from this hearing. But in this in this whole UFO conversation that, yeah, I mean, you can kind of deduce they're likely just making the whole darn thing up. They're selling their books, subscriptions and stuff like that, uh, all all based on fabrication. I don't get that vibe from Grush. I, I in fact, never did. One of the first reaction videos that I did on this was essentially saying, if you doubt him or question the claims, are you brandishing him a liar? And and the answer to that is no, at least not from my standpoint. And and why I say that is he could absolutely believe everything that he was told and maybe what he was able to fact check again to a point checked out. And that was good enough for him. That's not meant to be insulting. That just means that he believes what he's what he's saying. But you're saying now that maybe the information itself might not be as reliable as he believes it to be. Well, it, it depends on who his sources are. I mean, what if it is revealed that he is because these um, let me start that over. It, it, it has been revealed. Christopher Mellon, Luis Elizondo, that whole group has known him for years. He was at a UFO conference where Eric Davis was there and I believe Jay Stratton was there. So you, when you have all of those people that are running together. Are those his sources? Did he get kind of pulled into that? I mean, he does say that I think I think he said he has like thirty or forty individuals he spoke to over a four year period. So as as much as they could be a part of that pool, they could, I don't think they're representative of like the entire spectrum of people he's been exposed to. And it's it's one of those man, like because I know how you feel about you know that particular kind of group of people, and I've had similar misgivings about what exactly their motives are and. I, I'm in a bit of a weird position with it because I really appreciate what's happened in terms of the momentum that's been pushed forward with this discussion and it's legitimized it, it's you know, destigmatized the issue in the wider public and in the journalistic realm and the scientific and political realm. Um but yeah, there have been some weird moments with this whole thing and like TTSA itself was pretty weird and dodgy and like kind of gave us a bit of a misdirection of its real purposes because now it's just a media agency and before it was promising an electrogravitic platform to its shareholders so you know it's a slight transition in its mission objective so there's definitely been some weird stuff and um the uh, and again another ttsa issue that people just seem to brush under the carpet was the acquisition of all of these different materials that then went into a military cooperative research and development agreement with the u.s air force and they just popped off the map. Army. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, they've just popped off the map. So there's definitely issues. But um, at the same time, these guys in government, I mean, it's, it's like, could they not just be people in government who happen to be interested like us in this issue and had a, a level of access? And one of them was involved in, a, you know, a program that was at least looking at these kind of things. And so, yeah, they would know David Grush. They've got pretty high clearances, people like Lou and Chris, you know, deputy sec of uh, defense or intelligence and you know it, i know what you're saying about like oh he's involved with the same kind of he like runs in the same circles but it's kind of like well yeah of course he runs in the same circles because mm -hmm. these these are the ufo types in in the government and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're blinded by an agenda or bias they could they could genuinely want to try and get this out um so i don't know what to think 
to be honest about that whole situation of him being associated with those types of people um because it kind of feels like you would be when you're in the process of coming out with like you know i want to speak i want to i want to blow the whistle i want to talk to the icig well who's been laying the public groundwork for the past couple of years people like chris and lou and Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that he would f kind of, you know, flow into that channel if he was actually coming out with this stuff. But, uh, I mean, what does your intuition tell you right now about him? Do you think that he's, you know, sincerely trying to get information out that he thinks is real? I mean, do you think that there are programs personally? Do you think there are programs that are dealing with intact vehicles and reverse engineering? I mean, there's a couple loaded questions there. The oh, one no, about sorry, being... I've thrown a load on you there. No, 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 that, that, that's okay. Um, when it comes to, to, to David Grush himself, I, I will admit that the hearing was a much more impressive display than I felt from the News Nation interview. Uh, it was the way he delivered it. I'm sure they practiced, which is fine. That There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the delivery was a lot different. The claims were also not as explosive. We heard biologics, the word biologics, and that's fine. And everybody like started Googling that, I'm sure. Because uh, we heard dead alien or excuse me, dead non-human pilots in the News Nation interview. To me, that's a much different way to say it. I was going to ask you how you felt about the biologics comment. Well, he was much different in his wording. And, and there were a couple moments that, again, let me stress. I mean, I was much more impressed with the display and the presentation of information in, in Congress. If that was all I saw. Um, you know, it would be a little bit different, but juxtaposing that with the News Nation interview, the language was different. Now, what changed? And and that's what I want to know. Like, what is different? Is it because he was under oath? Is it just simply because he delivered it in a different way? And that's fine too. But but the the word biologics, uh, yeah. the immediate shoot down of the word extraterrestrial or, or alien to go to non human, and then that explanation. I was happy to get that explanation. Don't get me wrong. But it was just a, a something that stuck out to me that the language choice, the language choices, are are very very interesting to me. We had touched on Dopser, and I think it fits in here because I want to go back to it. Credit to David Grush for saying they only look for that security violation in anything that he was going to say. However, since the News Nation interview and now the congressional hearing, we have yet to see what he gave to the DoD for clearance. And I want to know why. Even Aunt, Congresswoman Anna Paulina Luna brought it up in the hearing. Now, with respect to the Congresswoman, I think she's a little bit maybe uh, misunderstood on what that process is because she says, well, it really helps your credibility. And again, credit to David Grush, who said, hey, look, Correct, sir. I had to. Yeah. yeah, I'd go to jail. I'd go to jail. It, it, exactly. And so so again, credit to him for for saying that, because that's true. It, it's not an endorsement. They don't fact check. Um if he was writing a, a completely fabricated children's book, he would have to do the exact same thing, you know, submit what he was going to be publishing to ensure that anything that he put into this child's book was not, uh, 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 you know, against uh, his, his security clearance or any classified information was entwined into a children's novel. So that being said, why won't they publish that? And it's fully cleared. There's no personally identifying information in it. And if there is, uh, by all means, uh, uh, redact that. However, it's cleared by the DOD. They're bringing it, bringing up that that fact in the congressional hearing. So, what I want to know is, were the the pilot bodies referenced in there? Uh, was the craft? We could assume so by what was reported, but as each day passes and they don't show us what the DOD actually did look at, that makes me question why. Because they felt the need from day one to say it. It was in the original you, debrief article and now the hearing, and they won't show it. And I want to know why. Have you been submitting like a request to try and gain that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That first day. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it wasn't as much of a red flag in the very beginning as it became as they just continued to reference it. That's the other thing. It wasn't just referenced and kind of forgotten. They keep going back to it about this Dopser review. And now again perfectly solidified that even a congresswoman is saying this helps his credibility. Again, I respectfully disagree with her her packaging of that statement. But regardless, everybody's looking at that Dobson review as, hey, look, he did the right thing. OK, let's see it. You know, and, and the, the other thing, too, that was kind of a red flag for me was the original 
Ralph Blumenthal and, and Leslie Kane article, uh, when she was asked by now multiple people, but in the beginning, I think it was Chrissy Newton, and she did an excellent interview. She's great with her questions. Uh, but she did an interview and Leslie Kane really pushed back on the whole, I don't want to talk about bodies thing. Yeah, he never talked yeah. to us about that. That to me is from a, if you're an unbiased journalist, in my view, uh, this is just an opinion. But if you're truly approaching something in an unbiased manner and a whistleblower is coming to you and he's claiming non-human craft and and uh, and and then like really puts the icing on the cake and said, yeah, they were dead pilots to go along mm -hmm. with it. Why would you omit the biggest part of that story? Well, I, I guess I guess is a you know a fear of the optics of how people are going to receive something like that. Uh, I, I mean, like hats off to Ross for just letting the guy say that kind of stuff mm -hmm. on on the record. And and uh, but yeah, I mean, I I agree. Like if if he's been validated, his position's clear. He's he's you know extremely high level U.S. intelligence senior. Then yeah, I'd post that I, if he if he said if I he agree. said that this was part of the evidence, I would personally post that. But I know that they were, I think, concerned that this was going to be one of those elements of the story that would end up uh, damaging it. But then, if you miss if you, if if you don't put it in and people find out that it was part of the thing, part of the story that he was giving, then it's like, well, why didn't you include that? So, but his credibility stays the same across the board with the claims that he's making. That's my yeah. bigger point. Yeah, is that yeah. if if you are presenting his story and what he's blowing the whistle on. In, in in just a, a very objective, here you go, here's the facts of what he's saying. Omitting what he's saying for optics, that to me was a concern. Now, it is fair that if for whatever reason, David Grush just happened to have never brought it up to them, but then later did to Ross Coltart, okay, fine. But I would love to see that Dobser paperwork then, because if yeah. it was in there, I took away from the article that they saw that that clearance from the DOD. And if bodies were in there, then, uh, well, we have a couple more questions to ask. Uh, if sure. they're not, then that that also adds to the story. So either way, that's where that Dobser paperwork becomes key. Uh, you asked if I filed the request. Absolutely. I'm trying to get it. Um, those things are open. Um, I've got a bunch of uh, either they did a DD Form 1910 mm -hmm. or maybe just wrote a letter. But regardless, uh, it seems like he wrote a letter. It was probably four pages in length. The reason why we know that for those who aren't aware is it, it appears to have been given to News Nation, at least, right. at the very least. We're led to believe it was given to Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane as well, probably the debrief editors. Mm. So if all of them can see it. Why can't we? Why can't we? And and the only defense I gave it up until last Wednesday was were there elements in there that were cleared, but they were hanging on to it for if he ever testified under oath to bring forward new details. And I didn't like that, but I I did I did lend that possibility um to the situation and and obviously we didn't really hear anything uh more uh arguably we heard a little bit less, you know. Are there any are there any of uh, are there any other reasons uh, that you could think of for withholding this publicly? The the Dobser request that he submitted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I after the hearing, no. If this if this conversation took place before I knew he was going to testify, I would say maybe an event in the future he will come out with more information. Um, again, didn't like that, but but that was a possibility. But if he was going to if there was more information that was cleared, that congressional hearing was the place to do it, and we didn't we didn't hear it. So now the question mark is is why? And I, I really can't. I'm open to ideas. I, I just the whole process is not supposed to be a private communication between him and his former employer, but rather it is to show what he can say in the open. And so now that he's testified under oath, I would hope that 100% of what he's cleared to to essentially give to the public is already out there. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't learn anything new. So no, I can't think of any other reason, not after the hearing. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can totally understand that because... Uh... I'd love to see what he'd submitted. You know, I'd love to see yeah. what he submitted to uh, to get cleared through. I I uh, assumed prior to learning a bit more about it that they had actually, you know, basically backed him up on this. And I was like, whoa, you know, whoa, hang on a second. Like, yeah. the DOD's behind him on all these claims. But no, it does seem to be more about, you know, security violations and any sort of classified information. Um, I mean, ideally, 
where would you like to see the hearings leading, let's say, over the next six to 12 month period? If, if things happen the way that you would like them to happen, what, what's, what does that look like? What trajectory does that look like? Yeah, just revisiting um, my comments earlier about agency heads in there. I mean, I, I think that if, if David Grush uh, gave them kind of a, a blueprint of where to go, a roadmap, uh, if you will, of, of the different agencies or different people, then the representatives of those agencies should be in an open forum and, and pressed. And you don't even have to tread into classified territory um, to do that. I, I truly believe there's enough in the public realm through all different agencies that that can show their hand in this secrecy that stretches back decades, not just in the last couple of years, but rather as a whole. And that's where I'd love to, to see this go. That's where I, where I wish it went last Wednesday. But I but I understand. Fine. I'll, I'll be patient. I hope it's not six months to a year. It probably will be. Um, you're, you're right on that. I just wish it wasn't. I mean, we're, we're dealing with something that is a, a, a big topic to humanity. I mean, full stop. You know, it doesn't matter where you sit on the fence. The implication offense, uh, the implications are staggering. So let's move forward with this. Let's try and figure out, is there, is there fruit here? Is there something that we can sink our teeth into and reveal to the public? And, uh, and, and I think although national security will play a role, I truly hope that scientific advancement and, and knowledge for humanity, as cheesy as that may sound, will trump that, at least the parts where we can now confirm, yes, by the way, these allegations are true. We have had technology recovered or something to that effect. That shouldn't be a threat to national security. I would think that that it would be, which, again, I'm kind of contradicting myself here. But let's face it. He said that there were these programs and that DOPS are reviewed. DOD says it's not a, a security risk or treading on classified information. So how can you classify something they already said isn't classified? So there's a lot of, of ways to kind of approach this that I think that they can bring this stuff into a public hearing, get those agency heads involved in the seat, and and turn up the heat. And, and that's what I think needs to be done. They need to address it. I'll give you a prime example uh, of where I'm going with this. Look at the, the hearing where they put in the Wilson Davis notes into the record that they were asking Scott Bray and Ronald Moultrie about the claims. They were clueless. Let's just let's just assume for a moment they truly were. I don't buy it, even though um, even though I have again he, my skills. He also he also messed up the introductions of that, and I think he said like Doctor Wilson and Eric. Yeah, like he, and so like yeah, I watched actually, it. Of course, I actually thought to myself like if they're really smart because he botched it, he don't did, correct him. He, yeah, don't correct him. So I've never. I've, no, no idea who these people are. Never yeah. heard of them, you know. But I know I thought the same thing when that happened. Of course, they they know something. They must have heard something about that. Yeah, and and especially if they truly were looking at the topic, because that's been look that's that's been in the in the spotlight in the forefront of this conversation. Right, right. So look how much time, as you and I speak right now, that's elapsed since then, and it was just about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks uh, within the last few weeks that Billy Cox interviewed Thomas Wilson and said nobody from Congress has yet to give him a call. So so during this process, during uh, a hearing where stuff is submitted into the record, uh, agency heads were questioned but not pressed. Uh, th that's where, again, I say turn up the heat. They, they didn't have any heat on them. Here we are all this time later. There's only two people to contact from that allegation, Eric Davis and Thomas Wilson, right? And yet half of those people at least have not been contacted yet. Well, and that's a big, con know. that's a big concern for me. I've heard different, there's, there's whispers on the grapevine, man. I, d I don't know. Cause I've heard other claims about people approaching him and, and, uh, you're talking about Wilson. Yeah. But I don't know how valid that is, but they just I mean, came from channels that I happen to just listen to if they say something. And, um, apparently that could be something that's happened, but. And, I mean, it, unless he's lying in public, uh, whoever you're you're speaking to, if they uh, hopefully one day they'll come forward. But uh, but Wilson himself said it. It, it was yeah. not a guess. Like he, yeah. Excuse me. He was quoted as as saying it. And that was what, like, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, Billy. So yeah. Billy Cox, who used to write for what was it, the Sarasota Sun Herald, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
been, he's kind of retired from from journalism uh, for that periodical, but still does a, a blog and has had a connection to Wilson for years. Yeah, and, uh, he got statements from him before. I remember. Big yeah, Fox. quite a quite a few. Oh, and wow. and Wilson maintains just as a couple of weeks ago that nobody from Congress contacted him. So okay. we can again lean towards he's lying, or if that's true, then what concerns me is the elapsed time when you do have members of Congress that are interested in this, submitting it to the congressional record, and not one person has given him a call to say, hey, you know, we're researching this. Can we get some kind of on the record statement? Yeah. And now fast forward to last Wednesday. Now we have David Grush with such explosive allegations that the web of people that are probably entwined, and you said 30 to 40 I wanted to ask you where you got that from because I, I I just might be drawing a blank. I might be I might be horrendously messing that up. I just thought that there was a moment in there where he said I've spoken to over thirty or over forty witnesses over the period of four years when he was he was referencing something. I might be getting that wrong, so double check me, everyone, before you start quoting that. But I swear to God, no, and, that's what he said. So, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, I just no, there's okay. so many different yeah. interviews and it's so hard to keep on top of it. But no, yeah, I I want to look into that. But but my whole point being is that now you've got these explosive claims, Congress wants answers, and that's great, yet they've kind of went down this path with a much smaller scaled story yeah. where they only had to call two people, and yeah. all we have are rumors that they called them, but Thomas Wilson is going on the record in the well, paper I will, saying, I will you know. say I will say that this rumor was given to me within the last week, so it kind of is post this apparent phone uh, this apparent phone call or contact from Billy Cox. So it could have been that the timing was perfect and the story's now changed, or this could be completely uh -huh. uh, completely just a hyperbole. So I don't know. I don't want to be definitive about it either way, but it would be great to see him in a congressional setting. Uh, I'm sure he just wants to be left well alone from all of this, whether he's yeah. uh, complicit or not complicit. You know, this is just a stressful situation for anyone at his age to be dealing with now. So I uh, I don't know if you'd even uh, agree to, you know, uh, an invitation. They they contacted Oak Shannon. I mean, like when I got him on for an interview, I said to him, like the first time I got him on for an interview, I said to him afterwards, there's a potential that this might put you in a bit of a spotlight, maybe uh, uh, some arm of the government might reach out congress or senate or you know some select committee mm -hmm. and they did um so it just makes me think if they've reached out to someone like uh someone like oak who at least in relation to like the admiral wilson documents is just kind of like a peripheral player that was mentioned in the notes surely they've tried to reach out to uh to the admiral but i mean you'd like to think so if they're doing their due diligence like you said i would they, hope so they, that they, they inserted it into the congressional record they're all very much aware of it now so like mm -hmm. here's a guy to call admiral wilson you know yeah give, give him a ring yeah and and look i mean again skepticism aside i encourage stuff like that i would sure. want to see him under oath and in one of his statements he said I, I i don't even need to be sworn in but that he would he would testify Meaning, like he he you know is is telling the truth. He doesn't need to to be subpoenaed and and yeah, and put yeah. under oath and and say it again. He'll he'll continue to do so. Yeah. So that's uh, admirable that that he would that he would do that and and uh, and and put that on the record. But the, to 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 take it a little broader, this is where again turning up the heat with subpoena power, where people that e e let's say a Thomas Wilson pushback and say I'm not going to waste my time with that. No, let's get let's get them in there. Let's let's figure out a way to get these under oath statements from key figures. And one of the things I posted on social media was kind of a list of I forget how many, but it was like eight or 10 people, Thomas Wilson being one of them, of people to get in there and put them under oath. Pentagon spokespeople included. I put them on the list because if there is a campaign to assassinate the character of certain individuals in this conversation and to make this topic look bad, then let's put people under oath and and ask important questions and that's where i i feel moving forward this is a dream scenario i don't think it'll happen um but who knows a dream scenario is a, a couple days where you where you have a couple days allotted to a hearing with full day of testimony and rotating witnesses that are coming in to tell their story and members of congress that that know their stuff and ask important questions you had mentioned some of them asked really you know, great questions, which they did. There were a couple that were fantastic. 
I also think it's because they posted on Twitter and said, hey, what would you like us to ask? And I think that they probably, probably went through probably. like, oh, that's a good one. That's, so, no, that's no bad thing either, I'll say. you know, No, not at all. Good no. Just putting it into reasons. context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so I, that's what I'd like to see, you know, and, and the reality is I hope it's not six months to 12 months before something else. We'll see, you know, but you're probably right with that. Yeah, it's going to take more months. The bigger concern, too, because some people will fire back at me, John, you're too patient. The process is working. Just remember, people get voted out of office. So those leading the charge, if things take a year or two years or three years uh, to, to kind of play out, those leading the charge could not be in office by then. And you're going to have rotating priorities. So if a Senator Gillibrand is not necessarily leading the charge with some of the legislation on the Senate side and so on and so forth. That's a big concern too, is, is you have the momentum now. And, and that's where I get like the, some yeah, people that yeah. have been really pushing for this. And then I think sometimes it's just trying to find a way to attack me in my viewpoint, no matter what I say, but it's interesting for me to see that where you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. Now you have the motivation. Now the snowball is going down the hill and you're like, Oh no, no, no. back off a little bit. Let's just let this happen. No, man, you got the motivation now. Like, don't lose it. You know, run for it. Go for it. Keep pushing. And and it's amazing to kind of see that play out because, look, I, I'm i I'm able to separate what I feel like skepticism-wise, remove that from the situation and say, hey, look, put these people under oath. Let's figure it out and and see what they say. I, I fully support it. I, I don't yeah. – uh, I, I, I called it a facepalm moment when the Wilson Davis stuff went into congressional record. I don't regret saying that, but since it happened and there's no going back, then yeah, let's get that testimony under oath. Yeah. And uh, and it concerns me the amount of time again that has elapsed since they did that to now. Well, it's good it's good to be uh it's good to be skeptical, I think. But I mean, I would imagine ultimately you would like to be wrong about the Admiral Wilson documents, mm -hmm. right? You'd like to be wrong. It would be great. And I've said that a ton of times, yeah. probably on your show before. Yeah, I think you have. Yeah. 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 Just to get it on the record, like you know. Yeah. You, you no, know, I would love. I would love for it to be true. And and if you don't mind, if I can just address one thing, please, because this is please. often fired back at me when I either say stuff like that or that people 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 claim that I don't want that to happen because my they call it my job. It's not even my job. I love my hobby like the, of the black vault, but I have a job. It has nothing to do with any of this. And uh, they say that that job is over that then there would be no need for the Freedom of Information Act. And let me tell you, if that happened, like, so, so let's say the Wilson Davis documents are confirmed tomorrow morning. Just because they are confirmed does not mean they go, okay, shroud of secrecy has been lifted. Here you go. Here's everything we have. Not a chance. Then you will need the Freedom of Information Act or something uh, like this process more than ever. And I think that some people don't realize that if that if we're lucky enough to get that type of a disclosure, Wilson Davis documents are real. David Grush is, is right. There are these secret crash retrieval programs. I guarantee that you will not have a full carte blanche access to to everything and anything that used to be uh, classified before. No, on the contrary, they will likely still have a big layer of secrecy on this. But you can build off of their confirmation of, again, whatever it may be. So you're going to need the Freedom of Information Act more than ever. And, uh, and, and I think that that's one of the biggest misconceptions about all of this is they, they, they meaning people who are skeptical to my viewpoint, think, oh, no, you're, you're just vying to stay alive in all of this. And it's, it's kind of laughable because, again, I think people don't realize you will need this more than ever, even that Schumer Amendment. I mark my words, if that passes, that's a bad thing, right? The, the, the JFK assassination review board, which they modeled that after was, uh, I don't want to say a failure, but it fell way short on what was promised. There are still thousands of pages withheld that they will not give you. So if that's the model, you're already off to a bad start. On top of that, the eminent domain that the government comes in and claims UFO or UAP related material is awful. There's people aren't looking at that, at least from what I've seen, because they will go in and confiscate it, and then they will decide on whether or not you and I should know about it. What good is that? 
no, you should not have that at all. The 25 year rule, uh, rule, which they've got inputted in there, granted, it's kind of inherited from, I think it's executive order 13526, but regardless, that's kind of standard anyway. But if that's a fallback 25 year after creation of a document, which means that they can sit on it, my record FOIA request response was 14 and a half years, which means the amount of time that you will wait for some of these documents to be declassified will essentially far outweigh any time spent on a FOIA request. Long-winded way of saying, I think people are championing championing things that may hurt in the long run, that the secrecy layers are not weakening with this or disappearing, but rather they're strengthening. And I was excited, too, to see Schumer's amendment until I read it. And then I went, oh, God, I don't think a whole lot of people are really seeing the repercussions of that. But the bottom line is you model it after something. You can now look back at that something, see how it turned out. And it wasn't good. And I speak as somebody who followed the records releases very, very closely when it came to the JFK Assassination Review Board and uh, created uh, dedicated search engines just to that and created a, a searchable database of those documents literally the morning of of all of those releases. And there were quite a few in the last three, four years. So I had watched that very, very closely. It's not just a guess. It, it turned out that what they promised and uh, what we were told was not what was true. And, and in the end, they still remain heavily, heavily classified in the tune of, I believe it's like three or 4,000 pages. Right, right. Well, no, I mean, exactly. It's, it's, this is a subject that has an extremely high level of sensitivity to it. So the idea that this is just going to all be thrown out on the table because we're in this process now is not a sensible way to look at it, in my opinion. Um, there are so many different checks and balances involved in putting all of this out there, especially when it implicates the military industrial intelligence architecture and all of these different contractors. I mean, I was talking to some of my Patreons the other day in a voice chat and uh, we were just saying, I mean, they're hardly going to throw their own contractors in jail. You know, this is, if anything, is also a PR nightmare just for the wider world yeah. and for their adversaries. If suddenly you're throwing, you know, Raytheon and Lockheed and Boeing contractors in prison for subverting congressional oversights and you misusing the budgets. And, you know, th this is a PR nightmare that the government doesn't need, especially at this point in time when there's a, a lot of uh, political tribalism and, and division and things are pretty uh, weakened state in the Western world in terms of governments, not just in America, but in the UK and in many other Western countries. There's just a lot of uh, fragility in government and how the body politic views its own government. So it's not a good time to be doing that kind of thing. And so they're going to obviously be some pretty substantive layers of secrecy involved to bring in this kind of information out. So I agree with you. The FOIA is still going to be a part of that process, of course. I would say that the people that are just truly saying, like, oh, you're holding on to your little career and like that they, they just they just don't like the way you talk, John. Like, you know, at the end of the day, I've had the same kind of things thrown at me. I'm very I don't think there's anyone really that could argue that I'm against any sort of disclosure process, that I don't want to see this information out there. I've just been a little bit critical and a little bit skeptical of certain elements of this whole narrative as, as it's unfolded since 2017. Um, and that's enough to be targeted by some individuals. And this yeah. is something I wanted to bring up with you anyway. I wanted to dive into this kind of element um, because there are these individuals on Twitter, quite a few, I would say that your fans outweigh them, but there's still quite a few people that are saying that you're a debunker, um, that you're a skeptical debunker, and this is all you're trying to do. So for the record, what is your current, um, what's your current position on UFOs, like what they potentially represent? Do you mm -hmm. hold, do you hold any belief that there could be a non-human intelligence interaction at play here? Like, how do you actually feel about UFOs in general? Yeah, I think this is a point that's largely missed by the crowd that kind of came in post-2017 right, to where right. I have long been an advocate that these phenomena, I think there's multiple facets to it, are absolutely real. I think a large part, of course, uh, are, are explainable by earthly means. But when you look at the actual evidence, you you look at what has come out through FOIA, uh, those who trash FOIA, I've I've often learned, have never used FOIA, nor do they understand what was pr uh, what has been revealed by it. When you look at just that, I don't claim FOIA is everything, but just focus in on that for a second here. That is enough to show me that this is something that lacks an, an, a full explanation. 
that there is no way across the board that the government knows what's truly going on with all of these things. Now we understand that because they're talking about it. But keep in mind, I'm entering my 27th year come August of filing FOIAs and, and seeing the evolution of this conversation. Now, does that equate to alien to me? No, I'm going to need a little bit more than that. But I can also safely say I haven't taken it off the table. And the reason why I say that is because you have technology being displayed in numerous government documents that lack, number one, an explanation, but number two, has no technology that could be attributed to it. So there's ones that are going back 40, 50 years, but showing air speeds, both confirmed by radar and uh, visual sightings of stuff that far surpassed what we had at the time. Now, fast forward to 2023, we're at that point where if these were secret government craft of some kind or something that could be connected to all of that and fill all the mysterious gaps over the decades of these UFO sightings, uh, we're at that point where we should be able to do that. And yet we can't. They still remain a mystery. You look at the 1976 Iran incident, well documented uh, through uh, the NSA, the CIA, even sent to the White House at the time. All years after the government said, oh, we solved the UFO mystery, there were things going on around the world that were just not something that we can, even in 2023, attribute a viable, undeniable explanation to. And I find that something that really needs to be looked at. I think a lot of people forget that history that that we have built this UFO conversation on. They think it's all started in 2004 with the Nimitz, jumped to 2015 with the Roosevelt stuff, and here we are with uh, you know present day pilots talking about their range fowler incidents and so on and so forth. But there is a long history here, just using FOIA documents that's solid, and and that to me is what keeps me going. Again, even after decades, can I tell you undeniably it's alien? No, absolutely not. I think there's a huge possibility the government is absolutely clueless. They have zero idea what's going on. They don't have the answers and they're holding it in some of uh, some vault of their own somewhere. But rather, we're being encroached by things that we just can't understand. And maybe there is crash wreckage somewhere out there. If there is, I don't think it's prevalent. So th this leads into some other grandiose conversation. I don't know if you want to go here, but I, I believe that if we do have crash wreckage uh, of some kind or a craft, uh, we don't have lots of it, meaning it, they're, they're not crashing every five to 10 years. I think that it would be like literally a once in a lifetime occurrence. And that that in itself would not be that would not be in the hands of somebody that would be testifying before Congress. I, 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 I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but where I'm going with this is I truly believe that if we had something like that, a, a list of people who were truly aware of it would be incredibly small. And on top of that, we would never hear their names. I don't buy it. I, I don't buy that they would be out there in the UFO conversation, talking to News Nation or anything like that. But on the contrary, we would never hear about it. And you look at our our secrecy programs, excuse me, our programs shrouded in secrecy through the decades, you would have leaks periodically, but not like this, meaning there have been aircraft and programs in development for decades and decades before we ever even found out about it. So when the government wants to keep secrets, they will. Now, is this that moment where the reality of, of extraterrestrial bodies and, and technology and craft are being revealed quite possibly, right? I'll give that, I'll give that a chance, but history has also shown that that possibility has been around for, for decades, decades and decades. There have been people that have, you know, come out. So, you know, I, that's why I wrestle on the fence because I don't know what to think. I want to give it a shot, but history tells us it doesn't always play out that way. So it goes back to why I say maybe the government is absolutely kind of clueless on this, that periodically there are craft of unknown origin that are zipping around that we see on our military instrumentation, the pilots are seeing, and they're absolutely clueless. And that's where I think the threat to national security comes in is the pure knowledge that we are weaker than whatever that is, we being America, and that that's why the U.S. military is forced to take it seriously now, even though I can prove beyond any shadow of a doubt they took it serious prior. There were documentation even from the Air Force that said UFOs that was not from the 60s, but rather the 2000s. So the evidence is there. 
that they've taken it seriously. But now they're in the corner that they have to say it out loud. And what do they do? Just because they say it out loud, um, their secrecy is, is strengthening even more. And I think because at the end of the day, they don't know what to do. They, they, they truly are clueless. So it's fun to think about that they have all the answers and all the proof and they're sitting on it because there's some all-powerful entity. I think there's just a big a chance that they are absolutely clueless, don't have the evidence that we need uh, to really prove this, uh, but are scratching their heads nonetheless. So I wish I had a better answer yeah. for you, but the evidence is there for me to keep pushing. And I don't discount, I don't consider myself a debunker. But I do consider myself someone is not af not afraid to debunk, and we shouldn't be afraid to debunk. Uh, exactly. We also shouldn't be afraid to question, because I I think at the end of the day, when you do do the approach like I and and I see a lot of others do as well, when you question the truth, you're not going to change it. Mm -hmm. It'll survive anything you throw at it. So. I don't understand the the pushback. I mean, even Luis Elizondo said when he kind of first entered the scene in, in 2018, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing here, but question everything, including myself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when he's saying stuff like that, and then you question him, and then all of a sudden you're like some big devil, um, that just kind of makes me scratch my head a little bit. But hey, it's, it's kind of par for the course and is part of this yeah, conversation. Well, yeah, no, yeah, I think you made an important distinction there, which is that you're not a debunker, but you're not afraid to debunk. And I think a good researcher, someone that's genuinely trying to get to the truth, will recognize that this subject in particular is actually, and I think everyone really, if they just sat there and really looked through all of the history of this, is inundated with bullshit. It's just inundated with either intelligence interference or just people role-playing and going, you know what, I'm going to say I'm in the secret space program and I was in this project on Mars and I fought the aliens in this other planet. And it's just like, you know, there's a lot of that. There's yeah. con there's conferences that literally just revolve around the kind of ever ever evolving door of BS claims yeah. with no backgrounds. Then there's some really good conferences where they bring some pretty solid information and they talk about it in a more rational way. But there is a whole cottage industry that's been developed around this subject where people profit from just telling stories. I mean, yeah. I've said this a few times. I've got, I've had, you know, people over the last few years reach out, maybe claiming a background, not really giving me much evidence. So it's pretty ambiguous as to whether or not they are or, or who, who they say they are. And they're saying interesting things. And, you know, there are people that leverage that kind of stuff. They'll go up on stage and they'll just say, you know, a source of mine, a contact of mine from the NSA, from this age. And it's like, you haven't actually validated that person. You've just been given a little hint that they might be someone interesting and you run with the story. And there's a lot of people like that. So yeah, I think with this subject, you have to be really discerning and you have to be critical and you have to be willing to scrutinize. And, um, you know, I think the people that look at what you're doing, where you're, where you're looking at these issues and sometimes tearing them apart, let's be honest, like, cause there are some pretty dubious uh, occurrences recently, like the uh, the military flare event scenario that was being twenty nine palms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like you know that. I think a lot of people actually agreed. Okay, this is starting to look a lot like military flares right now, and this yeah. is not an attack. I mean, yes, sometimes people like yourself might get fed up of hearing these claims getting circulated, and it can maybe come off a little sharp when you're going, "Look, this is a bunch of military flares." Most of the evidence, the majority of the evidence, is pointing towards that so there are people that see that as you attacking and i can understand that but at the same time if you just let these types of claims circulate and compound on each other it's just evidence for the skeptics to say hey yeah. see look it's like there's nothing to this subject it's like no hang on let's cut away all of the bullshit and just yeah. find the nice glowing gem rocks in the middle that are really legit and give us this uh desire to learn more about this subject because i'm like like you and we've talked about this privately i truly i mean I'm, i've experienced something i don't know what it is i don't know if mm -hmm. it's related entirely to the ufo subject or whether i should be talking to a shaman in the amazon basin about my experiences but something happened that put me on this trajectory there is a reality to it there is something to chase here there is something to grab onto what it is i'm not 100 percent sure but i'm pretty confident that it's not just all prosaically explainable and, and human generated but there is a lot of that there is a lot of lies there is a lot of you know intelligence muck thrown into the narratives and there's also just people making stories up 
So I, I just think if you're not a complete kind of radical that's not looking at it sensibly, you should be able to accept sometimes taking yeah. a little bit of a loss and going, oh, okay, that wasn't actually a solid case. All right, okay. I guess that's good that we now know that's not a solid case. So the ones that just attack you and say like, oh, stop, stop nitpicking. And it's like, dude, look, we're just trying to ascertain the clearest signal right in that no. one. And that's, that's kind of what I see you trying to do. That's why I've maintained my friendship with you. And I think that we've had, you know, disagreements on certain elements, but overall, we both agree that this subject is worthy of discussion. And that's why there's a mutual respect. Absolutely. And and the, one of the interesting things that I saw happen with the 29 Palms thing was when I had posted the videos that I did, and then Mick West had seen that, um, had created a, an overlay, um, and, and really just kind of drove it home pretty quickly that these were aircraft flares that matched like nearly identical to this video. And obviously more information came out from that. Again, one one of the most interesting things after Mick West had kind of created what he did through those videos, and uh, really kind of put it to bed that it was that it was flares. Somebody created, a, and I don't have to name them, but somebody had created a conspiracy theory that the videos that I had posted from that event were not in Wayback Machine, and therefore they were fabricated. Uh, by the DOD through me to to debunk the 29 Palms Triangle UFO. Now, normally I wouldn't give that credence, but guess who jumped in, and this is public, so I will say his name, was Jeremy Corbell to laugh at the al allegation, call it shenanigans, and essentially fuel that fire. Now, I've known Jeremy a long time. I don't think he cares for me much anymore. But that isn't needed here. We don't need to concoct a conspiracy theory that's founded on absolutely nothing because that then allows you to believe what you want to believe. That all goes into what I call the I want to believe syndrome. So it makes no sense that they would fabricate these videos. It just doesn't. And, and why I say that is because you can actually find them on YouTube with the exact same date that the DOD published them a couple of years ago. And so I kind of fired back. I'm like, wait a minute, you guys are really giving this conspiracy theory credence. I'm like, so are you saying that YouTube backdated this particular video, which further proves what I'm saying? Uh, you think we're all in on this conspiracy theory? And I thought that that would put it to bed and it did not. And for weeks and even months after people were playing into this and I saw other people that believed it would fire back at me and, and and essentially alluded to the DOD feeding me this stuff. My whole point is that we can't just fall back on concocting a conspiracy theory based on nothing to believe what we want to believe. We have to not be afraid to say, hey, you know what? We thought maybe this was a UAP, but we've solved it now. And then we move on. And yet with this, we couldn't do that. I mean, for weeks, even though it was beyond proven, I had to go through FOIA and then I got like tons of photographs and more video and all that stuff. And even for some, that was still not enough. And it's just really the long-winded way of saying, look, the, you can say that these phenomena are real. You can say there's a possibility that even some of them could be extraterrestrial. You can also say this one is solved. And I think that some people don't realize that the latter part of that is not shunning the entire history of ufology. An answer for one is not an answer for all. And I think that some people forget that. And the 29 Palms thing was a prime example, sadly, that it was easier for people to concoct a conspiracy that shows me as being this outlet for misinformation. That was easier for them to believe than aircraft flares were misidentified. I don't get that. And yet that's the reality of, of what we're dealing with. John, are you controlled opposition that's being incentivized or in any way financed by the Department of Defense? I am not. My check may be lost in the mail, but no. No, contrary to, contrary to belief, I now can't get the Pentagon to answer my questions. There are other outlets out there, and blogs even, that are getting answers from the Pentagon on current events in relation to UAP. I cannot get them to, to, to answer me. And, and to me, that's a red flag. Uh, one of the, the big ones is, and I've been pushing for two months on this, is the DOD's new push to conceal UFO and UAP information when it comes to Arrow. And they essentially are denying 100% of everything now. 
Now, I do have multiple appeals, but where I was trying to push with the Pentagon was why they felt that a law enforcement, so again, law enforcement exemption under FOIA, which is exemption B7, applied to UAP information. In some cases, it might. Let's say a UAP or a drone, because again, some drones are labeled UAP. We can prove that through documents, that a quadcopter goes into a military base. They don't know whose it is. They create an investigation because you can't do that. It's against the law. Those documents, when the investigation is open to investigate that, absolutely. B7 exempted. I get it. But sooner or later, they'll close the case and it opens it up. With Aero and UAP information, what they are now saying is exempted is essentially everything. I'll give you a short list of things that they've exempted thus far. Communications between the private organization UAPX and Aero. UAPX would not be involved in any law enforcement investigation, but that's exempted. Uh, the interviews of Dr. Oh, let's see, Robert Jacobs and Robert Solis, uh, those were fully exempted under B7 because there's a law enforcement investigation. Now, they're not going to open up a law enforcement investigation for a 1960s event that has already been investigated. I just don't see it. I'd be shocked if they did. So they're exempting that. A list of people that they interviewed through Aero exempted through B7. Communications between Dr. Gary Nolan and Aero exempted. And the list kind of goes on, and I've still got other cases open, but I assume that those will be closed as well. All of that is now being shut down. Two years ago, that was not the case. You could file something and, and generally get a response. Maybe they would uh, claim a B1 exemption, which is national security, but essentially you'd get things. Now, everything's being shot well, down. Why do you think they're doing that? Why do you think they're doing that? Well, your guess is as good as mine, it, but it is a B7 is very hard to, to, to fight through FOIA. So I believe that is, it is a bogus attempt to shut me and people like me down to access aero information. That's what I, I believe it's bogus. I don't believe there's any justification for it. Now, some people have tried to say, well, it's the inspector general investigation. If that were true, we would have started to see it in May. I think it was May of 2021. Uh, yet I never saw it. Never in 2021, never in 2022. And the first one was about uh, eight weeks ago in 2023. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, June-ish of 2023. So, so you can dismiss the inspector general thing. The David Grush thing, uh, it had um, uh, predated that, but plus it would have no effect because, you know, Grush isn't coming out with claims about Robert Solis. So, right, right. you know, it, they're not going to exempt uh, something like that. So you can dismiss the inspector general retort for, for all of this, um, and I can't find justification for it. So I gave the Pentagon some time, like six plus weeks to respond, but I have 90 days to submit an appeal. So I didn't want to wait any longer. I, I followed up probably off the top of my head eight or 10 times and, you know, multiple times a week, just going, well, what, just checking in, you know, hey, just checking in. And uh, I think twice I got a, I should have an answer for you tomorrow. And then that was it. So anyway, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but no, if I, I was mean, working for the government, I'd get all of this stuff a hell of a lot easier. And then I'd be able to feed you guys misinformation and then, you know, call it a day and collect my paycheck. But on the contrary, um, it's impossible for me because I, I think, in my opinion, the explanation is bunk. Um, on top of that, I don't believe that it can be justified. On top of that, I don't believe they want to go on the record about it because it will come back to haunt them. And I submitted the appeals to all of those cases. Hopefully, I'll win it. Um, we'll see. But yeah. it's 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 an attempt to, to to keep the shroud in in secrecy. It really is. Yeah. Well. Okay. So I mean, it's look. It's good to establish. Uh, I think two things just for people in mainly the whole UFO Twitter space. One that you don't think that UFOs are just made up, and two um, that you genuinely are not being influenced or paid off or are in, in cahoots with the Department of Defense or Susan Goff, because that seems to be something that's always reiterated by these people, the like yeah. contr cr controlled opposition. And I, I, it's just because you've got a different opinion. Like, can we not, can, can we just have some different opinions? Is that okay? Is it, is it okay to support 
you know, all of these uh, changes and the destigmatization, but then pick up on little contradictions and discrepancies and put them under a magnifying glass and be like, hey, look, I kind of, I like where we're going with all of this discussion, but here's an issue and here's a problem. And, you know, this yeah. is an issue. we should be able to do that without being labeled as controlled opposition or something like that. So I, I, I wanted to get those things. You would right. think, you would you, think that would you, be okay. You, you would but... think, but this is something that's not just affecting the UFO community. This is just like kind of general public discourse these days is you just have to tread so lightly and people have such highly like kind of defined beliefs and ideologies that you challenge it slightly and you come off as the enemy you just come off immediately as the enemy and that that kind of spans a lot of different issues so it's certainly not unique to ufology it just happens to also be present within ufology which is a shame but in terms of arrow um I mean, the whole thing seems a bit dodgy to me, and I'm trying to weigh up this whole thing with Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and him releasing a letter reiterating his point post Dave Grush's testimony saying, I didn't find any credible evidence. Then you've got David Grush uh, in the in the hearing saying that he actually spoke and had a classified meeting with Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick prior to him uh, taking office in, in Arrow. And then you have the ICIG saying that Grush's claims are credible, but Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick found no credible evidence. Like... What's going on here? What do you think? Because there's so many mixed messages, you know. Yeah, it's it's hard to answer that, and mm. and it um, it kind of goes to the root of why did the ICIG s- say what they did? Um, is it? And I'm not saying that this is true, but is it as simple as David Grush has an impeccable career, highly decorated, and is making a claim? Period. Right? Is th- that's a possibility that maybe they see that he's labeled a whistleblower? And they have to take it seriously. Marco Rubio in an interview said something very interesting. I don't think a lot of people either picked up on or wanted to pick up on it. But he says, we have a legal obligation to take this seriously. And and again, paraphrasing there. But it was the legal obligation part that really intrigued me. That doesn't mean David Grush is lying. And that doesn't mean that nobody believes him. But rather, there is a legal aspect to all of this where they kind of have to take it seriously. Exactly like the senator said. So I, I think you have a lot of that going on. But again, uh, there's a variable here. Why did the ICIG label label his complaint as they did? And how far did they take it? Right. And, and right. That, those are all things that I, would, uh, that I would love to see. But then on top of that, why was there such that language difference, which we touched upon already, but why was there the, the, the slight language difference in the testimony under oath? And there was one part that was a little, I would even call it uncomfortable, where he was making Grush was making reference to his News Nation interview, but did but but essentially did not want to did not yeah, want to was, to the was, question, which kind of saw uh, you know you can you can refer back to my News Nation interview for that right. comment, and they and they were trying to press him to get it into the record um, exactly yeah and so Congresswoman Luna yeah. whether or not this was planned or not I'm not really sure but but. I'll have to look back at the transcript and video to see how long it had elapsed after Grush had said that. But regardless, she had input that into the record and and submitted a News Nation article, which essentially had those claims. But that to me, I'm not sure it stuck out. I'm not, I don't know if there's even anything to it. Maybe he was getting tired and just was like, oh, God, repeating oh, I mean, himself a hundred times. No, but- I don't think it would be that. I mean. Based on the way that he was wording it, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just grasping at straws here, but I, I think maybe he was a bit more concerned in a congressional setting to say very specific types of language um, because of what it might implicate. I don't know. I mean, he said he would say a lot of things in a closed session, in a skiff, in a closed environment. I don't know if the open because I. I it's a difficult one, really, because like the News Nation interview, obviously that's been you know completely public. It's millions and millions of people watching it, and he did say pilots. He was like, "Well, you know, with these retrievals, you I mean, with these vehicles, there are going to be pilots." And so he kind of it, yeah. kind of he didn't necessarily say we have pilots, but he kind of like iterated like, "Well, I think he said he said pilots." He, he at the very least said naturally with vehicles come pilots, kind of thing, like a like an association, yeah. and so. I, I would like to know why specifically he felt he had to say biologics, because that's a very different turn of phrase to saying pilots of vehicles being recovered. I, yeah. I don't, I don't know what it implicates. I don't know what it really means. You know, in terms of like, is this something to be concerned about? Is it just very specific language in a congressional setting? He felt maybe he was advised don't say specifically that type of word. I don't know, man. It's very, it's yeah. hard to, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. 
Yeah, and and you, you're right. At this point, we can only guess. And this is where, when I say turn up the heat against the agency heads and stuff right, like that. Right, right, right. No disrespect for David Grush, but I think he's the type of person that's kind of like on this side of the conversation, if that makes sense, that I think he should get the same heat. You know, the the the, the biggest rebuttal to that of me when he said biologics, what do you mean by like define that? Mm. Like, the, the, why wouldn't they have him define it? I know that there's a a dictionary definition of biologics, which can include, you know, other types of, of biological life forms, but some of it doesn't make sense. So what does he mean by that? Does, did, is that just a fancier way to say pilots? Grush struck me as a very intelligent guy. So was this just pulling his brain thesaurus and saying something in a different way? Maybe, but I, I think that Congress should have just fired back and said, well, wait, what do you mean by that? You know, like, so you're saying that there are bodies buried somewhere you know and and if he was cleared to say it <clears throat> excuse me if he was cleared to say it through dopser without giving the location say it again under oath yeah and and that's the, again am, am i reading into it i i don't think so because that's such an odd word to no, replace it's, it's it's pilot bodies with it's definitely something worth highlighting i would say it's 100 percent worth at least saying like hang on why can't because these are the these are the micro discrepancies that can reveal a bigger issue if there is a bigger issue involved and if it's not then it's just a little you know whatever okay no worries later down the line it gets confirmed and and we can all just put our hats up and say that that's not a problem anymore but it's it's worth talking about you know why can't he say that under under oath in a congressional setting? You know what what exactly does that suggest? The, I I don't necessarily see, and I said this in my video breaking down the 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 uh, the um the hearing. I don't have a problem with people viewing Grush in a skeptical eye. I think he genuinely, like you, does believe the people he's spoken to. I think he's probably spoken to more people than just Eric Davis, Hal Puthoff, Robert Bigelow, Lou Elizondo, and like you know the kind of nids, a tip, amorphous. Uh, group, but I think it's probably extends beyond that. And I mean, you know, there are individuals that are in the background who want to blow the whistle, or at least saying they want to blow the whistle, who claim to be in in close proximity or are in these programs. Ross has talked about this before that there are other people he's spoken to, um, and it was actually, I think, if I'm getting this correct, last time we spoke, when last time I had him on. He was saying that it was Nat Kobitz who actually pointed him down to Grush. And if you remember who Nat Kobitz was, he was the uh, former U.S. Navy science and tech director that uh, struck up a friendship with Ross. And uh, according to Ross, divulged information, at least, you know, peripheral, just generalities about being exposed to multiple retrievals of vehicles that were unknown and uh, being shown a metal that he was uh, asked to analyze because he was a uh, you know, kind of like top tier metallurgist and a pioneer mm -hmm. in, in kind of welding, uh, arc beam welding or something. And he was the guy, apparently, who put Ross down the road to eventually getting in contact with David Grush. And there are others. There are others who were uh, at least claimed to be in the background waiting to uh, to come out. So maybe that's the next hearing, and maybe we're going to get additional corroboration of some of these things from people who aren't already known players that might make us go, hmm, is this all just mm -hmm. a, a circle of the same people confirming the same stories? Like, you know, because I, I, can, I can totally see that. I would like to see fresh faces. I'd like to see people that I haven't seen before with, you know, very good, high-level, validated backgrounds coming out and saying, no, what Grush is saying is true. This is the Lockheed program. This is the Raytheon program, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to see that. And the thing is, I know that you want to see that too. This isn't about a kind of, ha-ha, I told you so, they're not, they, these yeah. programs don't exist. You want them to exist. You're just a little bit skeptical of the information we're getting so far about them, which I can understand. Yeah. I, yeah, of course. I, I mean, I want them to be true. And what's funny is this is another thing that some some of my biggest haters don't realize. If this turns out to be true, the the world absolutely changes at that moment. Do you think anybody's going to care what John Greenwald said on a Tuesday? Like nobody cares, right? The world changes, and and that's something that that I would love to see. I would love to see humanity altered in my lifetime when it came to extraterrestrial life. You know, I mean, I started this when I was 15 years old because I believe that there was something to these phenomena. And although I can't definitively say this amount of time later, yes, it's definitely alien. I haven't shut it down and 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 dismissed that possibility simply because in my mind, there's too much. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's too much there. There's too much verifiable evidence. There's too much testimony. If it was one or two, fine. But that's not what we have. You know, we have a lot more than that. 
So these bigger claims, yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical because we should be, we all should be, and and we should be able to fire back comf- comfortably on the claim. And uh, and if they're telling the truth, then it absolutely won't matter. But I, I hope when it comes to Congress, their next step is to go to the root of what David Grush was saying. Um, I have not seen any statements I've tried myself. He said that he was going to give some stuff even after the hearing of names of of where to go. Um, I haven't seen it. Correct me if you've seen it, but I hope that that happened. I hope that he turned around and said, you know, here you go. Here's people to talk to. And there's your witness list. Yeah. But the one thing that I will say about that small group of people that I, I, I'm i with you, I hope that we see some fresh faces. What worries me, though, is when you look back, you have Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, uh, Jay Stratton, which makes sense, actually, with Jay uh, being involved with that because they work together. And Dr. Travis Taylor, um, you know, at a, at, a, at a breakfast table or lunch table, you've got those pictures floating around. He's at a UFO congress or conference where, you know, Dr. Eric Davis is there. So kind of, again, where you and I may differ on exactly what that means. At this point, evidence shows he is hanging out with the same, you know, smaller group of people. No, I, 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 I agree that-, that there could be a bias. There could be a bias at play. I, I agree. I agree. And that's and that's what worries me. And and again, it goes back to who were the other witnesses that whomever pushed back. Yeah. Um. I like Congressman Burchett. I I think I know you've interviewed him a couple times. I've tried. I really like the guy. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with with some of the uh, uh, more pointed things that he's said. I think we're a little bit far off of of making those those types of claims. But what what's interesting to him is he's just a, this fascinating, very likable individual. Who's really into this? And I want to know, like, what? Where is he getting all of this information? Yeah, he he thanked the Jeremy Corbell and George Knapps uh, of the audience uh, by name, but I want to know, like, has he branched out from that group too? And and I and I hope so because again, he seems like he has a very genuine interest in this, but from an outsider, a political uh, person like that doesn't have a lot of time to like hang out on, yeah, you know, Twitter or X. And and see what everybody's bantering about, but rather relies on a select few people to give them that information, and that's what that's what's concerning. Are his sources I, I get that. essentially the same as Grush's and, I, and Grush? Well, like, okay, yeah, I get that. I get that. I, I mean, I, I again, I would say his sources are almost certainly not the same as Grush's because Burchett's not at that level of knowledge and and informed uh, opinion on on this subject i think he's in that learning period he certainly seems to give me the you're talking impression. about burchett yeah burchett he's in the like that learning period of uh you know believing there's definitely been a cover up but doesn't really know enough about the whole subject he was getting a, he he indicated he was more informed in that hearing but you know i i think he's a great guy just all, all due respect to the guy but when i've had him on it's it's not necessarily a deep knowledge of this issue and someone who sounds like he's been speaking to sources in the mm. background or anything like that. So I think it's more of an introductory phase for uh, for someone like Burchett. And I do understand, and, and I, I I get what you mean with uh, like Jeremy Corbell and Knapp. I also have to think of it, I guess, from my own perspective of like, well, you know, here I am, like this, you know, young guy trying to put, put this information out there and, you know, people are starting to know who I am. Imagine if I got invited to DC or if I was lucky enough to kind of get these opportunities or if a media platform contacted me for an interview, it's like, am I, am I going to say no to that? Like, no, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to be like, absolutely, right. Yeah. This is exciting. Okay, right. I'm on, on CNN for the first time. So I get that as well. I, 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 I don't want to necessarily just completely uh, demonize these guys for being front and center, even though I think sometimes they've made bad takes. Like I've made bad takes, like you've mm-hmm. made bad takes. We've all made bad takes. It's I've okay. never had a bad take. Never, no. not not a single blemish on your record. Yeah, that's course. right. Flawless. I am so Flawless. sorry. Yeah, I, I <laughs> I'm just kidding. Me, Before know, somebody clips that part of the yeah. interview, <laughs> I'm just joking. He's just joking. He's just joking. No, no, we all we all made mistakes, and I think that's a fair enough thing. You know, I'd like it when people point it out to me. I might not like it at the time because we're all. A little egotistical. Oh, I'm not. I'm not wrong. What are you talking about? Oh God. Oh, I'm sh- oh I am wrong. Oh dear. I've re- I've rebutted three times already on Twitter, and now I'm realizing I'm wrong. Like you know, we're all yeah. like, this happens. This happens. So like, I kind of try and sympathize and think, okay, yeah, they've made a couple of mistakes. I'm not necessarily. I don't really think they should be inserting testimony onto the congressional record. I just think it should be the insiders and the people in the military who are putting that kind of stuff on the record. And uh, at, at at the same time, I'm like, well dude, if it was me, I'd, I'd love that opportunity. You know, if it was me, I'd love to be in that position. So, and and that's not necessarily coming from like 
uh, any any form of of jealousy. It's just like I I can understand and relate to the excitement of being in that kind of position. And and if I was given those opportunities, I'd be really happy. So yeah, I don't want to like fully just be like, oh, they shouldn't be involved. They shouldn't because they've done great work. They have done a good job. And Jeremy Corbell's very passionate, and George Nav's very passionate. But could they be affected by bias? Yes. Could they be affected by bad sources? Yes. Because this happens to everyone in this field and you have to be really careful about it. And it doesn't matter how many years you spend in this field, I would say you're still susceptible to getting taken down the wrong path or being influenced in the wrong way. And uh, we have to be cautious of that. So yeah, man, like uh, I, it's, it's a weird one. You want there to be a wider source pool for these people to be drawing from. And I, I, I agree on that. I think there is a wider source pool that is just not really being revealed to us right now. I do think there are probably a lot more people in the background that are being coaxed out um, from seeing these recent developments in the hearing. I mean, you've got to remember, I mean, if these programs do exist and these people are actually in these positions, they're seeing the news, they're seeing these people, they're seeing David Grush on the, on, on the congressional hearing you know, saying these things. So you've got to imagine that if there are more people to draw from, if there are more witnesses to collect, this might start serving as the impetus that drives them to actually mm -hmm. come out and start speaking. So it's a process. Um, I think I get annoyed when I hear a lot of the like hyper skeptical people who are just like throwing nothing but cold water on the hearing and, and downplaying everything. It's like, I still think this is worthy of recognition as a step mm -hmm. forward towards that evidence. Yes, we haven't got the, the, the concrete 100% evidence yet. I understand. But this is one of those nudging closer towards it feelings, uh, at the very least. So, patience, a little bit more patience, maybe. Yeah, you know. No, you're absolutely right across the board. When it came to the Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp, it was less that they were there, more so, so directly involved. Uh, not only with the Grush story, Jeremy Corbell went out of his way, you know, quite a few times to say that well, Grush came to us first, you know, and we're the ones that really orchestrated, really orchestrated this. For me, my concern, and this won't be popular with a lot of people, and you may not like it either, but I, I feel it needs to be said, it's the optics of all of that. And when you look at the the, the Jeremy Corbell and, and and George Knapp duo, they have championed someone like Bob Lazar, right? They, they, we, we can, I think, agree with that, that they have really championed that story for yeah. Yeah. decades when it comes to George Knapp, uh, quite a few years when it comes to Jeremy Corbell. Uh, probably made quite a bit of money off of that that documentary. All the more power to him. I don't I don't fault people people for for making a living. Um, but that particular story could absolutely not only confirm David Grush, but change humanity. And George Knapp has over the years claimed that he knew where the Element One Fifteen was physically buried, mm -hmm. and that 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 single piece of evidence, the fuel for for the for the craft, the the alien craft. Uh, was there that somebody could go out and pick up. And yet we don't hear that in the statement that they submitted to Congress. No, we didn't see uh, Bob Lazar's name mentioned. Nope. Uh, we didn't see him on the docket. I mean, if Jeremy Corbell arranged this, which he is claiming to have done, like he said that he orchestrated this, uh, I believe he said in Weaponized uh, the other day that uh, Ryan Graves was already asked, but he arranged for David Fravor and David Grush. I believe that that was what he is claiming. If that's true, and he played such a role, where is someone like a Bob Lazar? Where is Bob Lazar? You know. Now, I think the guy is is not um, a true story. Uh, a big shocker there. But there's too much over the years that have come out. My my late uh, friend, the great Stanton Friedman, did a lot of work on that. Uh, really dug into the Lazar claims. I think he did an excellent job. And really is convincing to show that Lazar yeah, likely would yeah. never have been put in that position. But all of that being said, that's where I go back to the optics, right? If David Grush could be absolutely spewing 100% absolute gospel about what he's seen and heard, the optics of those individuals there, again, this is not going to be popular, but the optics are not good because of because of the claims that they have made in the past, uh, who they champion, yet that's conveniently left out of, an, or of a congressional hearing that they like played a big role in. Um, that to me, I think is going to hurt I, I, for, for the most part, um, especially coming off the 29 Palms thing. We all know that that was put into the Daily Mail and a, quite a few other places as this triangle UAP. And it all went back to those two individuals, even contrary to evidence at hand. And even after evidence was shown, they were really still hanging on to it. More so Jeremy Corbell. George Knapp really kind of backed off that I saw 
uh, commenting on it. But um, just coming off of that, again, it's it's the optics. So I hope it doesn't come back and 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 bite them. But if members of Congress start pushing and start looking into that, they may start asking those types of questions. Well, wait a minute. You guys have had for decades a guy who worked on eight or whatever alien spacecraft at Area 51. Like, where was he? Like, where, what's the proof? And if that's bunk and uh, they, they determine that, then will that hurt Grush? Again, yeah, yeah. if he's telling the absolute truth, will those optics come back and hurt? So I know the root of what I'm saying is not going to be popular. And I know I'll be, I can just see the hate mail when this video drops. But it is something to consider, and and it's something to to take into consideration, uh, given the gravity of all of this. Oh, John, I agree, mate. I do. I agree. I think it is something worthy of consideration because I'm very skeptical of Bob Lazar, and I think, uh, to be honest, the reporting that Dean Johnson's done on on that subject on Twitter has been very good in terms of yeah. getting getting into some of the the minutia of that story and some of the claims that have changed over time and. No, I I think you're absolutely you're absolutely right. It's not I'm not we're not trying to um you know throw fire on these guys. It's just the fact that there have been some issues, some discrepancies. If Bob Lazar was who he says he is and this was, you know, your number one resource that you have to prove the reverse engineering programs, why is he not being put out into a congressional setting to give testimony? Yeah. Why is he completely quiet? Why is he refusing to have an interview? Well, not refusing, I shouldn't say that. Not responding to the request for a discussion with er um, Eric Weinstein on the Joe yeah. Rogan podcast. You know, so it's like, for me, it's like, dude, come on. Like, if you're, really, if you're really confident that you know your physics and you know your science and you know how to talk about it to another physicist, another scientist, then you should just go on and kind of clear that record. And then obviously not being in any way vocal about the uh, congressional hearings or any future congressional hearings and being involved in them or giving testimony like yeah come on guys like come on this is this is suspicious behavior you know yeah even, even if he's telling the truth he's kind of acting a bit suspiciously about it right now for whatever reason and it's like you know where's the element 115 and all of these stories you're absolutely right i mean we have to look at it like that and go look there have been problems there have been yeah. things that have never been proven that have been like kind of thrown into documentaries and profited on for a while and nobody's addressing it. We're all just kind of forgetting that that stuff actually happened. Yeah. And then having the same people who, you know, propagated these ideas about these people now in a congressional setting giving testimony. And I, I said the same thing about I don't want this to backfire on, uh, you know, the, the information coming out. Because a lot of the skeptics who already have an agenda, who really want to disprove all this stuff, are just going to go, and they already are. Uh, see, look, it's just the same gang, and it's Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp, and they're you know they're in the background giving testimony, and they're using that already as a way to uh, defang the importance of this potential hearing, uh, the potential importance of the hearing. And I still hold to the idea that David Grush is not just pulling his information from the pool of people that we now see as the main players involved in this subject. I think he is certainly got information from more uh, sophisticated sources than just a few people that we know of in the in the public domain i'd like to think so i want to see that i want to see I that information so. coming out we both hope so like i yeah. th there is nothing about this that i don't want to be wrong about if it's skepticism and right about if it's optimism because i really want this to be legit and i yeah. you know like i just i said this we'll, we'll wrap up soon but i'll just quickly say I am an experiencer, like I have seen something for myself. I do have a genuine, at least uh, subjective knowing that there's something else out there. So I'm sitting here like, come on, man, I want the world to understand that this is not just nonsense. It's not just crazy talk. So I think it's fair to, you know, highlight problems and contradictions on that road towards getting clarity. Otherwise, we're not going to get full clarity. So, yeah. you know, the ones who attack you for that, John, I just think that they're just, you know, a little bit too biased and a little bit too kind of fired up about everything that's happening. It's like a single toe out of line and you have to be cut down. It's like, it's not fair. It's not a fair way to treat people. Yeah, I appreciate that. And and one one thing that I'm uh, planning, not trying to give a plug, but, but just to kind of address that, that I think that some people forget or don't know, like pre-2017, why I'm around, you know, like why I'm here, why my, I haven't had an experience, but, um, what I have seen keeps me around. Right. You know, if I, if I was convinced there was nothing to this, um, I really like Mick West. Uh, I really do. I think he's a great individual and important voice in the conversation. I really don't agree with everything that he says, 
but he really keeps everybody on their toes. But if I was in that mindset where I just had kind of had an explanation essentially for everything um, and assumes then there's nothing being hidden that can't be explained. And I've kind of friendly bantered with him on that. Like, well, you know, you're kind of assuming that nothing is being hidden. I really don't care about the leaks um, and I don't care about the stuff that they'll release in a hearing because it likely can't be explained. They're using that as a tool. They're using that in 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 their ability to put that information out being explained. I want the stuff that we can't see. So we can't assume nothing is there. But I kind of feel like he feels, yeah, there's probably nothing there, even right. if we were yeah. to see it he's anyway. All, he's operating from that assumption. Right. And and I don't mean that disrespectfully. He's actually kind of said that. And that's where he and I have kind of gotten in these friendly banters back and forth on social media. But my whole point in, in bringing uh, him up, because I don't like to talk about people when they're not here, uh, is if I was in that mindset, you and I wouldn't be chatting right now. I wouldn't care. Like I wouldn't, right, right. I wouldn't be known for UFO information on the black vault.com. I would still probably have, you know, the archive of information, but I really wouldn't care to like talk to people about UFOs if I just felt like they were all explainable. So I'm, I'm planning this event on, on my channel free, not, not ticketed or anything, but, but to give an exploration of the last 26, 27 years of my journey, just to kind of show people like, there's something here, and it's not because I want to show you where I'm coming from, but rather where I feel like the world should be on taking this seriously, because it didn't start in 2004 or the last five and a half years uh, when it comes to these phenomena, but rather there's there's something that goes back a long time, as you know, uh, arguably well beyond uh, when humans even took flight. So, you know, there's, there, there's a lot there, and so that's what I'm planning on doing just to kind of have fun. I mean, the majority of the people aren't in that mindset of attacking me. It's it's kind of interesting because I mostly see it on Twitter and Reddit. And I think they're actually the same people, but they have like the same uh, attacks. And some of them are actually, um, joking aside, getting pretty serious with them, not only against me, but even other people. Yeah. I hope that yeah. that tones it down a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of really getting tired of it because it's, da it's dangerous on so many different levels. Uh, because there's so much passion that people have, but some people just don't know how to take an opposing view and they really get into, and I know you've seen it too, oh, yeah, just yeah. Trying rhetoric to that's people. not healthy well, I mean, online you know, at all. Trying to reveal people's personal information, doxing, like yeah. doxing and harassment, targeted harassment from, it's just a really weird thing, man. Like, I don't know where exactly this all kind of catalyzed from but it's just over the last few years you've got these very um aggressive and targeted harassers on twitter and they've yeah. kind of formed into these little groups and they you know all talk amongst themselves about how important they are and they're bringing down the anti-disclosure uh enemies and it's just like you go you guys are batshit crazy you know that yeah. right like you're actually just a bunch of crazy people but i mean I wouldn't pay them too much attention. I think the the less attention we give to people like that, the the less uh, they have an impact because they thrive off of attention. They, they thrive off of people giving them a reaction, um, and they're not. Again, this is not unique to the UFO community. Welcome, yeah. to, welcome to internet culture, twenty twenty onwards. You know, we're just it's it's a pretty murky landscape for anyone. I'm so glad I'm not a kid going through school now, dealing with social media stresses yeah. and all of the problems involved with coming in through like the digital age. I just managed to avoid that given my age, so I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, it's present in the UFO community. You do get these these harassment groups, and they usually like to pretend that like the white knights. They're like, you know, I'm the we're, we're trying to save and clean up, and we're doing the good yeah. thing, and we're trying to help. Look what then, we did. <laughs> yeah, and they're the most toxic. They're the most toxic and like aggressive and rude and like you know, it's just it's just a bit. Of, it's embarrassing. I mean, it's just not good. It's not a good look. And they bring and out. I think that they don't realize that either. I no. think that they truly feel that they're doing, they're doing good. And, yeah. and you know, you're always going to get those people in the conversation. The, the 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 dangerous part of this, and I can just say from from I'm only speaking for myself here, but found myself on what they called a, an extermination list that uh, they wanted to silence me and a few yeah. others. And um, that kind of talk is is dangerous. Somebody else chimed in and said, "Oh yeah, that plan is underway." And this is the same group of people. They tried to dox my business. I sell yeah. headphones, electronics. Yeah. And uh, they, they not only dox the address. Now, I think ahead. It's not where I live. Uh, it, it's all it is is a private mailbox. Yeah. 
Um, but they tried to dox that because they felt that that's where I physically was, but then fabricated an entire uh, lie about what I did for a living just to try and discredit me. Now, uh, you had mentioned, thank God you had, uh, just because of your age, dodged a lot of the social media BS. My son is nine right. and he is going to sooner th- than later, you know, start branching out using X uh, and using social media. And I'm going to try and keep him from it as long as possible, but he's a smart little dude. I mean, he, he's, he's doing, um, you know, amazing stuff and he understands electronics. He's going to find his way on yeah, there. He's yeah. going to start surfing around. He'll, he'll figure it out with or without. And he'll, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it, it worries me that he's going to start seeing talk like this. Now, granted, Twitter actually stepped in and, and removed the one for threats of violence, but you look at the memes that are out there and the, and the, the actual harassment, You know, not disagreement, not even strong language worded my way, but I'm talking about really awful things, especially that ties into, and I'm not sure if you're aware, I don't need to say exactly what they fabricated, but that I run a certain type of adult themed business, we'll put it that way, and has created images. They've created images of me, you know, in front of some stuff. My son's going to like see that one day, you know, and it just makes me cringe that people just like, they can't get out of their own bubble, man. This is a great conversation. We can disagree and do all that, but really think about what you're doing to other people. I've never in the history of me using the internet doxed someone or tried to like post their, their, their video or attack them personally. Look, I know some of the things I've said are not popular, but those are based on ideological differences, you know, differences of opinion. Uh, To do stuff like that is, is, is just out of hand and, and it, it, and it's dangerous. And, I, I said long ago, and I'll say it again, even though you and I disagree, these are the types of conversations that need to happen. It should flourish because you challenge me like I, I'm taking notes. Like, I don't know if you notice because I always learn something from you. Right. And there's always something that I can take away from talking to you, which which I really enjoy. Why can't other people do that? Yeah. Imagine what some of these people who do these memes and stuff, and they clearly spend a lot of time doing graphics and, and all that. Imagine if they took that time and tried to actually make a difference, like a real difference, you know, not these harassing types of, of objectives. And it's a shame, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, somebody's going to log onto your channel, see you interviewed me and attack you over it. And that's such a shame, but it's going to happen. Oh my and, and, it, and it's, a, and you know, the bottom line is I hope it, I hope it gets better. I hope more people speak out against it. I've seen you do that speak out against it. Uh, I've spoken out against it myself, but the violent rhetoric from some of these people, like we're creating a war Mm -hmm. with the government. This just came up this morning with somebody who posted something. I think they regretted it after they posted it, but I pretty much called it out because my picture was used. And I'm like, you know what? Like this war stuff has to stop. Like it's to wake up and see that it's my picture and a couple other people warring against like David Grush and all these people. I'm like, I'm not at war with anybody. It's like, come on, this is ridiculous. And I laugh about it now, but it is serious because I think that some people don't realize how influential their their rhetoric can be. And they use that type of violent rhetoric. And to them, they may not fully mean, hey, go out and start busting down doors or, you know, get bodies to fall to the floor or whatever they want to say. But other people may not understand that and go, yeah, I'm going to make a difference. Yeah. And I've seen the, the uh, I think it was against Gillibrand, but- a very aggressive comment towards her. I've seen one towards Tim, Tim uh, Burchett. And, and you look at that and you go, what are you doing, you idiot? I mean, these are uh, the last people you want to start putting threatening messages to because you're going to get a knock on the door from law enforcement, but they do it. So I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but the bottom line is I hope more people speak out against it. It is becoming even worse uh, as time goes on. And um, this is about UFOs, man. It should be fun and enlightening and uh, about changing humanity if it all turns out to be true. Not not any of that BS. Mm-hmm.